Hey there, it's Torben Nygaard, and welcome to Dark Deeds. Before we dive in, I want to thank our sponsor, Rough Camp Camping Gear. Rough Camp is one of the only suppliers of camping gear in the US that offers indestructible tent stakes and more. Now, let me take you back to 1950, to a bustling manufacturing plant in the heart of industrial America. This is where our story begins and where it will end in tragedy. Meet Jack Mercer. Jack's the kind of guy you might pass in the hallway without a second glance. At 42, he's been with the company for 15 years, working his way up from the factory floor to middle management. Jack's life has been a constant uphill battle. Imagine having to work the night shift at a gas station to put yourself through college, all while your wealthy classmates are out partying without a care in the world. That was Jack's reality. Now, enter David Sullivan. David's 38, been with the company just five years, but he's already making waves. He's got that easy charm that makes people gravitate towards him. While Jack was pumping gas, David was probably leading the debate team at his Ivy League school. Can you feel the tension building? Because Jack sure could. For several years, Jack watched as David sailed through the ranks. Every promotion, every pat on the back from the boss, it was like a knife twisting in Jack's gut. And then came the day that would change everything. Picture this, the office is buzzing with excitement. There's champagne, there's laughter, and at the center of it all is David Sullivan, newly appointed general manager. And there, in the corner, is Jack Mercer, his face a mask of congratulations, but his eyes. If looks could kill, David would have dropped dead right there, the uncontrollable rage surging inside him. Now here's where our story takes a dark turn. As Jack drove home that night, his mind was racing. He'd given 15 years of his life to this company, and for what? To be passed over for some smooth-talking hotshot? No. Something had to be done, and it had to be done quickly. Over the next few days, Jack's mind became a pressure cooker of resentment and rage. He started noticing things, like how David always took the 6.30 train home, how there was that dangerous railroad crossing on the outskirts of town, how easy it would be for an accident to happen. The plan came to Jack in pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle of malice slowly coming together. His plan would happen like this. He'd invite David out for drinks after work, a peace offering, he'd say, a chance to bury the hatchet. He would be sure David would have a good amount of alcohol to loosen him up and make him vulnerable. Then he'd offer to drive David to the train station, but they'd never make it there. The night of the murder, Jack's hands were steady as he poured drinks for himself and David. Was it his imagination, or did David look a little smug as he accepted the olive branch? It didn't matter. Soon, it would all be over, and Jack would be back on top at the company and take the position of general manager that was stolen from him. As they drove towards the railroad crossing, Jack's heart was pounding so hard he was sure David must hear it. The distant whistle of the 6.30 train pierced the night. Jack's foot pressed harder on the accelerator. Hey Jack, isn't this turn coming up a bit fast? David's voice was tinged with concern. Jack didn't respond. He had to focus. His eyes were fixed on the railroad crossing ahead, the warning lights already flashing red, the banging of the bells screaming at them angrily. But all was ignored. In those final moments, as the train bore down on them, Jack turned to look at David. He wanted to see the realization, the fear in those eyes that had always looked down on him with pity and arrogance. But what Jack saw wasn't fear. It was confusion, then concern, for Jack. The impact was deafening. Metal screamed against metal as the train plowed into the passenger side of the car. In the chaos, Jack managed to stumble away, leaving behind the wreckage and David. But this isn't where our story ends, folks, because fate, it turns out, has a sick and twisted sense of humor. And it was about to play a cruel joke on Jack Mercer. As Jack limped away from the scene, his ankle throbbing with each step, the acrid smell of burning metal and rubber filling his nostrils. He thought he was in the clear, 
But then he heard voices. Two railroad workers, Pete and Mike, were heading towards the wreckage. And that's when they spotted Jack, a shadowy figure stumbling away from the carnage. Now, picture this. Jack's heart is pounding so hard, it feels like it's trying to break free from his chest. He can hear the blood rushing in his ears as he tries to act casual, just a passerby who happened to witness the accident. But Pete and Mike, they're not buying it. They've got questions, and Jack's got a limp he can't explain. What follows is a nerve-wracking game of cat and mouse that would make even the most hardened criminal sweat. Jack is desperately trying to cover his tracks, but it seems like everywhere he turns, Pete and Mike are there, asking questions, poking holes in his story. Jack manages to make it home, thinking he's finally safe. He goes upstairs, removes his clothes, and gets into bed. But remember when I said fate has a twisted sense of humor? Well, it's about to deliver the punchline. Jack's wife, Sarah, bless her heart, she's worried sick about him. When the police come knocking, asking questions about Jack's whereabouts, Sarah does what any loving wife would do. She talks. And boy, does she talk. She tells them about Jack's resentment towards David, about the lost promotion, about how Jack had been acting strange lately. In her attempt to help her husband, Sarah unknowingly seals his fate, revealing the motive Jack had tried so hard to hide. He hears the police and Sarah talking and feels defeated. The walls are closing in on Jack. He can feel the noose tightening around his neck with each passing hour. Finally, unable to take the pressure anymore, he confesses. The police slap the cuffs on him, and just like that, Jack Mercer, once a respectable middle manager, is now an admitted murderer. But wait, because fate isn't done with Jack yet. Oh no, it saved the cruelest twist for last. Picture Jack sitting in his cold, dark jail cell. The weight of what he's done crushing down on him. Thoughts rushing in, reminding him of the evil he committed. So in a moment of utter despair, he decides to end it all. But just as Jack is taking his final breath, guess who shows up at the police station? That's right, Pete and Mike. You remember Pete and Mike? the two railroad workers who were following Jack. And what news do they bring? Brace yourselves, because this is where our story goes from tragic to downright Shakespearean. David Sullivan, the man Jack thought he had murdered, had actually died of a massive heart attack in the car, minutes before the train hit. The autopsy report was clear. David was dead before the impact. Let that sink in for a moment. In his blind jealousy and rage, Jack Mercer had orchestrated the perfect murder of a man who was already dead. He threw his life away for absolutely nothing. And so, dear listeners, as we close our first chapter of Dark Deeds, I want you to think about something. Look around you. Look at your co-workers, your friends, maybe even your spouse. How well do you really know them? What darkness might be lurking behind those smiles? How far would they go to get ahead? Because the scariest part of this story isn't the murder or even the tragic irony of it all. No, the scariest part is that Jack Mercer could be anyone. He could be the guy in the cubicle next to you. He could be your neighbor. He could even be you if pushed far enough. Sweet dreams, folks. And remember, always keep one eye open. I'm Torben Nygaard reminding you that sometimes the most dangerous monsters are the ones hiding in plain sight. Until next time, stay safe and watch your back.